All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us here at the Polsky Center for another ETA-themed workshop over the lunch hour. We are so thrilled today to have Ram Jani, who is a partner at Better Price, uh, who works on a number of things over there, but, um, but has been doing a great deal of transactions and ETA kind of themed transactions for many years. And it's been a great partner uh, of both me and, and our work here at the Polsky Center. So um, have always truly appreciated his partnership and, and so thrilled to, to, uh, to be able to present him today and have him share uh, his wisdom. Uh, we'd love for today's session to be pretty participatory. So we'll have you um, submit questions uh, using the chat. Um, you can just post those to the, the, the general chat and um, we'll and, and feel free to do that throughout the presentation. You don't need to wait until the end and we'll, we'll kind of uh, pepper some of those those questions and comments throughout the uh, the presentation. Uh, we will be recording today's session and I'll uh, it usually takes a few days to process those recordings, but we'll be sending those out to all registrants. Um, so don't worry, you can reference back to this. Um, and uh, and one quick plug, we have two weeks from today, another ETA themed lunch workshop. We're doing a careers and ETA panel. Uh, moderated by Alex Hodgkin and featuring a number of, of Booth alums who are um, working in executive suite positions at acquired companies and also some alums who have gone through CXO programs. So really excited about that coming up on the uh, two weeks from today, so the 28th. Um, hopefully we'll see you there for that. But without further ado, it's my uh, my privilege to, to introduce Ram Jani uh, for today's Legal Aspects of ETA presentation. Great. All right. Thanks, Paul. Um, it is my privilege to be here speaking to you guys. Um, so I appreciate you inviting me and I'm happy to do it. And I see a lot of familiar names and faces here um, on the on the screen and, and uh, excited that you guys are joining us today. So um, my my presentation today and I'll, I'll pull some slides up here before too long. Um, but the presentation today is, uh, it's going to kind of run the, the gamut a little bit. And, and so it may be, and I'm seeing some, you know, some clients on here and some investors on here. And so it, some of it's going to be a little basic um, for some of you, but I think that's important um, <clears throat> to kind of get, get through some of those basics because there's, there's obviously a number of people on the, on the call who are maybe at closer to step one. Um, and then we'll also talk about a, you know, deal process and, and sort of when to engage with your lawyer um, and, and then some of the, the kind of key legal diligence um, parts of a transaction or some of what we're doing um, on the legal side, just so it, to, to kind of help with your familiarity. So um, hopefully it's a, it's a useful presentation. Jump in with questions. Um, it's going to get more advanced as we go. Um, so it's like one of those kind of online tests where like the first questions are kind of easy and then it gets harder and harder as you go. So um, the better we do, the, the, the more into the, the weeds we're going to get. Um, and, but if we stop and want to deal with the early stuff, let's do it. Um, so I'm going to pull my slides up here. And, um, and like Paul said, uh, just uh, drop questions into the chat as we go. And, um, and, and then we'll make sure that we cover them as we go. It, it'll be, it'll, I think it'll be more relevant for everybody if we cover them as we go, as opposed to coming back to questions at the end, because I, I think we'll, we'll, we'll probably have lost our train of thought on some of those things. Um, all right, that being said, um, and, and Alex Hodgkin, if I get anything wrong, feel free to jump in and, and correct me. No, you're good, Rob. You're, good, you're the subject matter expert here, man. I'm just along for the ride. Thanks for doing this today. All right. All right. Um, here we go. So hopefully the slides are up for everybody now. Um, and away we go. So like I said, basic legal matters up front. Um, then we're going to talk about transaction timing um, and, and sort of when when you engage with your lawyer throughout that um, the, the, the process of a transaction and then some more in the weeds legal diligence um, highlights or lowlights. Um, so what is a search fund? Um, this, is, this is a traditional search fund, a vehicle that's set up for one or two principles to raise money from investors. Um, and then they'll, that, that, that allows them to search for a business to buy and then they will acquire an established business. Um, it's, it's not a startup play. It's not a turnaround play. You, you typically don't buy distressed assets. You don't you know, buy, buy, buy a sort of you know, unicorn 
um, startup entity that, that's you know VC, that's emerging company, that's different than a search fund. Um, typically, you will raise enough money to um, you know to, to fund your search for two years, and and so some people will raise less. If you're doing a self-funded search, you can um, you can obviously not raise capital and, and still do a search fund. Um, and then you can work through an incubator, and we'll talk about a little bit of the spectrum of, of sort of ETA and the spectrum of, of search funds um, on the next slide here too. So the initial search capital, I'm seeing the range of 400 to in the 600s. Um, 700 is is for a duo search. I'm I'm seeing as well. I think when you get above into the sevens, um, you start to see people saying, "Hey, that's a little rich. Do you necessarily need that money?" And then if you do need the money, if you're living in um, New York City or San Francisco, or if you have, um, you know, again, for two searchers, um, for sure. And, and in the COVID era, people saying, hey, I think we might need 30 months to find a business so you can be on the, the higher than, than seven side. And I would typically see 400 as kind of the floor, but certainly you could raise less than that if you wanted, if you just didn't think that you needed the money or if you were going to raise um, in, a, in a jurisdiction that's fairly low cost from a living perspective, you could, you could certainly raise less money, but, but 400 is usually the, the kind of lower end um, for solo searchers. Um, initial search capital is raised from about 10 to 15 investors. Those investors are also going to be the people who will most likely invest in your transaction. Um, it's never 100% exactly the same, but it's also you know, very rarely 100% that you know do not participate. So you know that's when you are choosing your search fund investors, um, it does really matter. And and you know you should view the search fund um, investor conversations that you're having as two way interview views. Obviously, they're interviewing you whether they want to invest in your search fund, um, but you are also interviewing them. So the 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 benefit to an investor at the search stage is they get a free look at your deal. And they also get a step up on their search stage investment capital. So if they bought a $30,000 unit, um, it would become $45,000 on, um, on the cap table of the acquired business. So um, entrepreneurship through acquisition or ETA takes many forms. Um, and this, I think this list is probably growing, although, you know, and again, although it's, it's not a list and it's not necessarily buckets. There's also, I, I think of it more as a, a spectrum or a continuum. So one version of this is a traditional search fund. That's sort of what I outlined on the first page, traditional search fund, go out and raise, um, you know, half a million bucks from 10 to 15 investors and go and search for a business and then go back to those investors and give them a step up. That's a, a very kind of plain vanilla traditional search fund. Um, another way to do ETA is through an accelerator. Um, so NGP, um, you know, uh, is, a, is, is sort of a well-known accelerator here in Chicago. Um, other accelerators include Search Fund Accelerator that people know about as well. And um, <clears throat> those accelerators, they, their goal is to still do ETA. They just do it not in a traditional kind of classic search fund, but they sponsor, um, they, they sponsor you as an entrepreneur in residence. And, and again, I'm sure there are different presentations where somebody can um, you know, go into more detail about, about the advantages and disadvantages of accelerator, um, even advantages and disadvantages within the accelerator um, model of, of which, which version is, is better. Um, and then you could be an entrepreneur in residence with private equity. So you could link up you, you as a person um, who wants to search for a business to buy and then run it could link up with somebody in, um, in private equity. So you could link up with a private equity firm. I've also seen it where somebody is leaving a private equity firm and that private equity firm says, hey, don't leave and go raise a search fund. It's fine, we'll, we're happy to back you as an operator, but why don't you just stay and, and you know, kind of keep coming to the office. You won't work with us, you won't work for us technically anymore. And we know you're looking for a business that's maybe a little bit smaller than what we were looking for. And we know that you're gonna run it. Um, but why don't you become an EIR with us? So that's a way to be a, an entrepreneur with, um, in residence <clears throat> with private equity, or you could find a private equity shop that wants to back you um, in that way. You could be a captive with a family office, very similar here, where you know family office has the capital, they want to do the investment, um, and, but, but you are committing to kind of finding a deal for them, but they're going to pay your expenses, et cetera. Um, you can do an unfunded search. I, I, I use these terms. It's it's a little, it's not quite right. I think um, self-funded is 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 really what it is. I mean, you're just in the 
um, EPA world, people think of it as unfunded because there's not professional capital or other people's money coming into the search, but obviously it still takes funds. So it's a self-funded search. Um, that, that's the right fit for some people, um, advantages and disadvantages of, of each of these models, but a, a self-funded search is another common approach here where, I mean, and, and, and you know, honestly, every person or any entrepreneur or anybody in the world could be a self-funded searcher if they are, they may not even know it. They may not know that they're searching for a business and they may just run into a deal and say, boy, I'd like to buy this business. And they call me and say, hey, I want to buy a business. And I say, oh, are you a self-funded searcher? And they say, I don't even know what that means. I'm just looking to buy a business and I, this thing fell on my lap. And I say, okay, sounds good. Um, so, it, you know, again, it, it's a spectrum and it's a continuum. Um, you can be an active independent sponsor. So, so people will confuse um, search funds and uh, certainly traditional search funds um, and self-funded search funds and independent sponsors, I say they confuse. It's not really a confusion. It's more just that, again, there's a little bit of a melding of these. But, but to me, when I think of an independent sponsor, I don't think of somebody who is necessarily uh, wants to step in and be the CEO. I think of an independent sponsor as somebody who maybe wants to be a little bit more active, a little bit more engaged. Um, than traditional private equity, or I think of somebody who doesn't want any engagement at all, wants to bring a deal with, together with capital, take a little slice, get a deal fee, make, you know, make some carry, and that's it. They don't want to be involved. But an active independent sponsor, I do consider part of the ETA spectrum. Um, and then, uh, you know, again, fundless sponsor is sort of uh, same as an independent sponsor, but a fundless sponsor in, in, on my continuum here is somebody who's just bringing a deal together with capital and doesn't want to be involved in the business at all anymore. And, and, and that's that you now, to me, you've moved off of the ETA spectrum. Uh, but fundless sponsor, again, just a, kind of another word for independent sponsor. Um, so that's kind of as we, as I think about this and as you're you know, sort of putting yourself into a bucket or into a category, um, and then some people will call me and say, hey, I don't know whether I want to raise a traditional search fund or not. Or they'll say, I think I want to do three deals. I don't just want to kind of become the CEO of one deal. And I'll say, okay, that's fine. You know, let, let's think about what's the right model for you. And you don't have to fit into one of these buckets. We've done things like a subscription fund where you get some capital um, to, to, to kind of keep the lights on. Um, and, and the person who puts in the subscription capital will get probably a step up and will get probably a first look at a deal. Um, but it doesn't mean that you're going to just buy one company that you're going to run you would get the ability to look for different deals and then you know potentially kind of lead lead acquisition transactions. So again, I don't want to get mired in this, but I want you to know that a lot of the principles that we're going to talk about today apply to any of these um, sorts of transactions. Um, the alternative structures, you got to think about advantages and disadvantages. Why would I want to do one of those? Um, you know, why would I say what why would a self-funded search be better? Why would a traditional funded search be better? Why would an accelerator search be better? Um, you know, a number of different reasons that that those things um, you know could be uh, could be beneficial to you. So, payment of salary. Do you need a salary? Some people do. Some people don't. Um, if you need a salary, self-funded search may not be the right thing for you, right? Because you're just basically eating into your own savings account. Um, what about a back office? Um, you know. I think some people can do a search fund with a sort of modest back office and they want to do it themselves and they want to create that. Um, <clears throat> they want to create their own CRM and they want to kind of deal with all of that themselves. I, I think the accelerator will tell you that's inefficient, that, that you should use us for that because there's no sense in recreating the wheel for your search fund. Um, I think traditional search funders will say it doesn't take that much time for me to do that. There's a bunch of resources that other searchers have used. It's not really that hard. I'm going to do that. And part of part of what I want to do is be entrepreneurial and kind of do things maybe in a way that's a little bit better than something somebody else has done. That's okay, right? You just have to think about these different things. Um, what about the connections and network and, and mentoring? You know, in a self-funded search, sure, you're not taking other people's money. You don't have to give away the step up. But when you do find that deal and you need to raise $10 million, are you really going to be able to do that? Are you going to be able to do a $10 million deal off your own personal balance sheet or from, you know, family relationships or people you, you used to work with. You might not be able to take that $10 million deal down. And so sometimes with self-funded searchers, we end up seeing um, more like SBA style deal. So a, a $5 million purchase where you're taking on an SBA loan, keep a lot of the ownership, um, but you're giving a personal guarantee. So maybe that's exactly what you want. Maybe you don't care. Maybe you've got zero assets and you want to do a $5 million deal. Self-funded could be the perfect spot for you to be. Um, so 
again, you just think about these different things as you're thinking about making this decision for yourself. Decision-making authority. If you've got an accelerator, um, you got to make one kind of quote person happy. If you're in a search fund, you need to get to seven, eight, nine people happy. Um, is that good or bad? I don't know. I mean, what if you make one person mad and you can't get a deal done? Well, if you made one person mad in your traditional search, it doesn't really make any difference. If you make one person mad in the accelerator, boy, that could be a problem. But this isn't, I mean, again, I, I, the accelerator folks that I know, and I know the, you know, the, so the people that lead those, they're, they're not making, they're making business decisions. These are, it's not like you made somebody mad because you, you know, missed the, the garbage with the paper that you, you know, threw toward it. It was, it's because they really think this isn't the right decision um, to, to make an investment. It's a business decision, but you might think, you know, more, and, and that's totally fine. You might be somebody who's done this for 25 years, if you have a, an accelerator model might feel a little bit kind of like it impinges on, on your authority, that that's maybe this isn't why you're doing ETA. So, um, but the capital commitment is another one. I mean, you know, when, when you're doing an LOI with a seller, a smart seller is going to say, um, <laughs> do you have the money? Um, you know, and, and if you don't have the money, uh, that's not a great answer. In an accelerator, you have the money. Right. If, if again, if you're backed by the accelerator, the accelerator can write you a letter of support. They call capital in a search fund, traditional search fund. It's not calling capital, but you can certainly get support letters from investors and you can get support letters that make it very clear that you're you're almost certain to get the deal done. Not certain, but you don't have to go through some fancy approval process. Um, if you're a, a self-funded searcher and you're doing a small deal, you know maybe a letter from the SBA that that says that you're in, you know, in good, you know, in, in that you're going to be able to get this deal funded. That might be important. You might need to get that done. Um, sometimes on the SBA size deals, there's less sophistication and and you can sign a very limited letter of intent and kind of get there. So, um, but but certainty to close is something that people are going to care about. And raising capital in a traditional search fund is, you know. It's doable, but it's hurting cats. It's not hard, but it just does take time because you got to get on people's calendars and you got to get commitments, et cetera. Um, and then uh, in a self-funded search, if you end up moving you know, up market to doing a $10 million deal and now you need other people's money, you're basically going to end up back in that sort of traditional model if you're going to traditional search fund investors. Um, and, and so those are some things, again, no, no right, no wrong. Um, those are the, the, that's the thought process you got to go through um, as, you're, as you're making this decision. Um, search fund formation. So th this is um, fairly uh, basic. So when we're working with a search fund, whether it's self-funded or traditional or not, we don't do this as much in the, I mean, within the accelerator setup, each, each accelerator does it slightly differently, but, but you will um, have your own vehicle to some degree to do your deal and to, you know, to sign letters of intent and, and do that. So, so having a, the basic formation, you need a certificate of formation in Delaware. You get an EIN, um, employer identification number from the IRS, very basic. The certificate in Delaware is a few hundred bucks. The EIN doesn't cost you anything. It's just you have to fill out a form with the IRS. Um, anyway, so then, then you need a basic LLC agreement. So when you're setting up your vehicle, if it's just you, it's a, it's a single member LLC, it's a you know, disregarded entity. We don't worry too much about it. If, even if it's a duo search, very limited um, sort of basic setup document, an LLC agreement for a, a governance document. Um, and then you'll have a, a basic corporate resolution that that sets out um, the officers. And if it's just you, you're the judge, the jury, and the executioner. You call yourself whatever you want. Most of the time, you know, people take the CEO or managing partner or um, you know principal type of position. And 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 then um, you know you can get a bank account set up so that you can bring in capital. And um, you also can uh, uh, do a you know again all of these things are kind of um, basic, basic organizational matters. And, and that way you have a, um, you have a real entity so that when you're doing all of this, you're not doing it as a person, as a human being, you're doing it through your entity. And that gives you some um, liability shield or, or protection on, on your own personal assets as you're kind of going down the road of ETA. So um, the, the next um, stage, and when you're doing, again, traditional search fund here, different if you're doing self-funded, you don't need to do much other than that step, step one. If you're doing a traditional search fund, you put together a, a PPM. Um, on the legal side, we focus on disclosures and, and uh, risk factors, sort of legal disclaimer type language. Um, some people do a, a slide deck in addition to that. 
Um, we will look at that on the legal side. We will look at your PPM. We don't draft it for you. We will look at it. We will give you feedback on market terms. Um, but it's your PPM. You know, we represent the entity itself. So just to be clear, we don't represent you as a human being. We represent your entity. Um, but at the, this initial stage where you're putting that PPM out, my job is to just make sure that you, when you send that PPM to somebody, if you're going to put something in there that's off market, I'm not going to tell you not to do that. I'm just going to tell you that it's off market so that you should be ready for the question. You can do whatever you want. It's your it's your decision. Um, and then when you're when you've gotten through your PPM and you've gotten you know you, you then send that out to investors, have a bunch of conversations with investors again, two way street interview as you're thinking about who you want in your um, you know in your group. And uh, so the the other documents that you need then then you finish the PPM, you have kind of an email from somebody saying I'll buy a unit. You confirm that in writing. Again, it's not a um, that, that's not a legally binding obligation, but you should be tracking that in writing just so it's, you know, people can kind of forget, hey, I'll buy a unit on the phone. It's like, okay, you send an email, they're going to buy a unit, but you don't actually send out legal documents until you've got that full commitment for your search fund. At that point, you need an LLC agreement. The LLC agreement is going to have the language about the preemptive right to purchase. That's the, the, the pro rata right to, to buy shares. And it's going to have the 50% step up language. Um, you need a subscription agreement. The subscription agreement says, you know, I hereby agree to buy one unit, um, and you know, I, I agree that I can lose my shirt if this investment goes to zero. I get that what I'm doing is paying you, you know, money investing into your fund that you're going to search for a business, and it's possible that you don't find one. That's okay. That happens, right? And and then you have an investor questionnaire, very much a form document. Make sure that your your investors are all accredited, and and so in this search fund world. Um, all the traditional search fund investors are all accredited. There's no issue there. If you're going to bring somebody in to your group, um, they really should be a, an accredited investor. Um, so like our recommendation is that you don't bring in search fund investors who are non-accredited investors. I think people do it, but it's not because we think it's a good idea. It's just because they want somebody else in their search. I, I think for non-accredited investors, it creates two issues. One, they have a right of rescission on that search fund investment. But two, it's almost assuredly going to create a gap in your equity financing. Because if somebody's not accredited, yeah, they can write a check for 25 grand or 50 grand to get into your search fund, but are they really going to step up and fill their pro rata um, at the time that an M&A deal comes in? You know, uh, unlikely. I think they just th those checks get to be much bigger, 750,000, a million bucks, a million and a half. Like th those become more difficult for people who are not accredited investors. So typically, all these investors are accredited. And then you have a side letter, and the side letter is non-binding. But what it does is it sets forth the basic terms for your acquisition stage LLC agreement. So that's where we start talking about what your carry is going to look like and, and sort of how it's going to vest and, you know, your board seat. Some of those basic, basic terms for the acquisition, we put those into a non-binding side letter up front at the search because it's just not, it's not worth negotiating those deal stage documents when you're pre search or right at the beginning of your search. So, so that's what we do. We just, we put those into a side letter, protects both sides, protects, you know, you as the searcher human being, protects investors. It, it's clear that we're going to be kind of down the middle um, when you get to doing a deal. And again, we represent the fund there um, in, in connection with all these documents. So, so those are typically low negotiation documents. You know, we, um, I think, you know, the investors are comfortable with our forms and, and, you know, it's very, <clears throat> very much a set of, um, very much a set of documents, very much a collaborative sort of effort to to get those documents to final and, and you get them out, get them signed, and you're um, you know off and running as a search fund. So that's the um, that's the the basic um, search fund legal. So this is what it looks like from a you know picture standpoint. Again, I've limited it to four um, investors, but that's just for ease of of reading it. There's you know again typically ten to fifteen to to twenty or you know depending on what you want, and then you have the they own the search fund. And this is at the search stage. What they get, what an investor gets, is 150 percent step up and the preemptive right to purchase um, at at the acquisition stage. So that's the um, contractual terms that we've built in. Uh, then when you're getting to the acquisition stage, this again, just on the equity investment side, we're not talking about the, the purchase agreement. I have a whole different, you know, a whole different presentation on, on purchase agreements and things that you need to, to know there. And, and you know, I'm, I'm sure that I will look at the, looking at the names of, on the people here. I know many of you have actually seen this before. So um, this one is, is at the time, the equity investment documents that you need for your search fund at the time of an acquisition are an investment memo. So this is like a PPM except that this one is just ties to your actual transaction. 
Um, you, we send out a notice to everybody. So remember, everybody has the right to participate in the transaction. So we send out a notice to everybody, hey, we're doing a deal. Um, and your preemptive, per, your portion, your pro rata portion of this um, equity is going to be a million dollars or $500,000. Do you want to buy? Do you want to invest? Um, you need a subscription agreement at that time. That again is now for, for the actual amount of investment, but same thing. The form looks very similar to the search stage one, um, except that you now actually have certain, you know, the investment memo ties to the actual transaction. Um, and then you have an LLC agreement. And this LLC agreement is much more significant than the search stage LLC agreement, but this is where we build in your economics, we build in sort of governance that the, you know, the, the you have to go to certain, uh, you know, you go to the, to the unit holders for certain approvals, you go to the board for certain approvals, and then the CEO, um, you know, which is you as a searcher have um, certain approvals. So um, I see Nico, uh, you've raised your hand. Um, uh, Paul, can we unmute Nico to let him ask a question here? Hi, Rob. I'm sorry. Just to go back to the uh, the search fund formation for the uh, the initial the site letter you mentioned, that technically is considered non-binding, right? So if I put in terms, the investors know that oh, I want to talk about this later, but that's no obligation on their part to agree to them, right? That, that's exactly right. So so it's a non-binding side letter. It does lay out guardrails for what the deal is going to look like. If you think you are going to, if, if you and your investors have had a discussion, so you put into your PPM, I'm going to get a, you know, 40% carry instead of the, the 25, right? So solo searcher and then get, make some assumptions here. You, you, you put in 40 and it's because, you know, you're the, the most brilliant person in the world, right? I mean, so, um, and, and the investors say, that's right. You are, we've, we, we have definitively determined you are the most brilliant person in the world. Therefore, we are going to um, give you a 40% carry. If you put that in your side letter, it is non-binding on them, but you would have a very, very high likelihood of ending up with a 40% carry in your actual transaction stage agreement. And this one that we're, that's on the screen now, this binding one, because it was it would be very clear that that discussion was had. If you had 40% in your PPM and you talked to one or two people about it, and, you know, but we just went out with the standard side letter, which just says, you know, a third, a third, a third, 20 to 35, you know, it's like the, the 25% for a solo. And uh, I think your likelihood of ending up with 40% for your carry is, is very low, but it's non-binding. So, so does that make sense? I mean, it's not binding, but if you, if you're going to change a fundamental term, like what your piece of the carry is going to be, you really should put that into the side letter, not just think you got it through in the PPM. So I think m most of the time, and, and I, I see some investors on here too, and they can obviously disagree with me, but I, I think the investors, different investors spend various amounts of time on reading people's PPMs. Um, and I think searchers who think that their PPM has been combed through are, are probably um, mistaken. So um, so I'm going to, I'll keep going here. So the LLC agreement, contains these provisions, though they, they contain your economic provisions, they, contain, they, they it, may, it contains governance provisions, and then it contains provisions about what happens in the event that you um, are exited as CEO um, during the course of the ownership. And again, nobody really wants to talk about that. Um, and it doesn't happen that often, but it, it, it can happen. And, you know, certainly there are, there are the cause type termination and that, you know, you're stealing from the cookie jar. If you're doing that, you're going to lose all your equity. That's just sort of standard. Um, but it's a, it's a pretty good, like when, when I think about the definition of cause for a search CEO relative to the definition of cause for like a private equity CEO, um, I think the definition of cause for a search CEO is actually relatively CEO protective. It's still, you know, it's still cause. If you're stealing from the cookie jar, it's cause, but it's not one of those private equity ones where it's like, if you, you know, fail to follow a reasonable directive, somehow that becomes cause. So I do think, but, but, you know, there are, again, there are variations on all of this. And, and um, I think as it is an important thing for searchers to think about, I think, Five years ago, I would have told searchers, don't worry about it, it doesn't really happen. Um, but I think over the last um, you know, three, four years, there have been more CEOs who have moved out of their position as CEO for various reasons. Sometimes it's, hey, you know, spouse got a job somewhere and I just, I just can't really run this business anymore. 
Um, and other people, you know, performance hasn't been great. We'd l- really like to see you move in this direction. And the CEO says, I, I just don't really, th- that's just not the direction I want to move. And I'm going to go do, you know, I, I think we should do something else. And meaning like, I think we should kind of negotiate an exit for me. And, and that's, if that's the case, then, um, you know, if you have sort of pre-agreed to terms on what's going to happen with your equity, i.e. it's going to get bought out um, at fair market value, or it's going to get bought out um, at some discount, or it's going to get bought out at some premium, it's one thing. Or you can just have a discussion. As part of my severance, you know, I'm going to get, uh, you know, we're going to just pay you $100,000, or we're going to pay you $200,000. And in connection with that, you know, you're going to sign a release, and we're going to get rid of, um, we're just going to be, your equity is going to fall off the cap table. Again, this doesn't happen when the equity is worth millions and millions of dollars because the, the investors have no incentive to remove you as CEO at that time. That's a fear I think that, that searchers have is that somehow investors are going to, it's going to be, you know, the business is going to be worth a hundred million dollars. And now the investors are going to take away my equity. I, that I have never seen happen. And I think the investors will tell you that is lunacy because it's a very, very small world, as I think most of you know. And if an investor, if the searchers got wind of an investor doing that or a board or some, some you know, group of people kind of getting together and just taking some searchers money, they would never get to invest in these deals again. Um, so it's a, I think that's some of the, the protections that we have um, built in. So that's the sort of um, the search stage legal equity documents. Um, Let's see. So we have a question in the chat here, um, and I think the the self-funded um, searcher seeking limited investors once target is identified, which of the 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 things apply, and how do they differ? So for a self-funded searcher, you wouldn't. All you really need to do is get your um, entity form. That's what you need. But in the in the scheme of things, if you're going to have several investors you will need, um, you know, you should do an investment memo. So you basically, you know, they should have full information about the deal. Um, you don't necessarily have to send this notice of and waiver of preemptive rights because they don't have any right to invest. Um, but they would need a subscription agreement because they're going to invest into your um, LLC and then you would need an LLC agreement. Um, and, and when I work with self-funded searchers, I will still typically just start with the traditional search fund form. Um, and then we scale it back because it doesn't necessarily need all of the belt and whistles. But so you do need a, a significant amount of, of this paperwork, but we can streamline it and, and simplify it a little bit. Um, I'm going to I'm going to kind of skip over the search fund economics because it's not it's a little bit. Um, I mean, I think most people here know, but th- this is what's in the, the LLC agreement. So it's kind of a, a you know, carry is a third, a third, a third, a duo searcher. Um, gets 30% of the upside. Solo searcher is is 25% of the upside. So for the duo, it's 30, meaning you each get 15. Um, and the vesting is very, very standard. A third vest at the closing, a third vest over time. And I think that the kind of common right now is four years and monthly vesting for four years. I've seen some, you know, kind of one year cliff plus monthly, but most of the time for search CEOs, this is not about you know, being there for a year, it's about being there for, for, you know, four years. And so the, the equity vests, whether it's monthly or you get a clip after a year, I'm not sure that it makes a, a ton of difference. Um, and then the IRR hurdles, again, are, are typically 20 to 35% for the, that's the last tranche, the last third. And um, we're also seeing a fairly common flip to a cash on cash version after you get past five years, because five year, a five year, um, 35% IRR is uh, is a, a real challenge. So once you get out past that, um, I think what you really are, 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 you know, what you typically see is more like a um, a 20% growing cash on cash. So you're, it becomes, it's it's like, a, it's called the MATLAC formula and it's like a, um, it's like IRR in some sense, but it's also more, but it's, it's really calculated as cash on cash, but the cash on cash grows, which makes it more, you know, look more like IRR. Um, so, the, so the, the, the another um, another good question in the chat. This is a this is a fun one. Um, so you know, for non traditional search fund, if you're going to give different investors different terms, um, how does that work? Definitely doable. We do it. Um, that I would say I would call that more of an independent sponsor um, version. It gets it gets quite complicated, and you know, savvy investors will sort of seek most favored nation type of clauses. 
Um, so you, you begin to look more like private equity than a search fund when you're starting to do that. And, and again, it's like on my spectrum, you're closer to the independent sponsor model. So for sure you can do it. Um, we, you know, we can, we can draft whatever you want. Uh, but I, I think you run a little bit of a risk of people, you know, finding out about each other, but different people, you know, a, a big check size writer can command better terms. This is it's very typical in private equity. Um, so why should it not exist in, in search funds? Well, it doesn't exist in traditional search funds because it can't. I mean, contractually, everybody gets the same terms. Um, in a self-funded model where you're going to look more like an independent sponsor, you can certainly do it. And um, I, I would agree that you would pr probably do it in a term sheet first um, because it's very complicated. <laughs> it's a lot of legal work to, to draft all those terms. And in my experience, um, you know, we end up we end up with kind of two different tranches at the most when you, when it gets too complicated, um, people kind of find out about each other and say, well, wait a second, why, why am I not getting that deal? And, and, you know, and the, the around the edges, it's just not worth it. And we end up just with one set of terms, but, but we can certainly do it. And it would be um, built into the, into those uh, deal stage documents, like we just talked about. Um, the, the four-year vest, Good question. The four-year vest starts on the date of the acquisition, not on the search fund formation date. Um, so it's so you need to be with the acquired business for four years for that to fully vest. And for one reason or another, um, those units are not. You know, it's right now in the search fund world, it's not market to have those um, time-based units uh, fully accelerate upon a change of control. But but you know, again, we, we there's some places around the edges where. If you're, if it's a, you know, kind of a, a good deal, a good upside deal, they will typically um, fully vest. But there's some nuances around around kind of how we get there, and it's just a discussion that you and your and your investors will have, and, and kind of the key investors especially will have. So this is the picture of what the um, what the acquisition stage looks like. Um, you know, again, the, the a bunch of investors into your search fund. You could have a rollover seller owner up at the search fund. Um, I think that simplifies things some. You could have a rollover seller owner down at the acquired company. You can have senior debt. You can have mes debt. I mean, again, lots of different ways to, to sort of do this. But um, this is kind of a basic structure diagram that, that people have but most of the time on a, on, a, um, on a search fund structure. And this is either traditional or, um, or self-funded. Because at that point, typically, even if you self-fund your search, you have other investors in there. Um, if you if you don't, then it's obviously you simplify it because the only LP is yourself. Um, from a you know the legal standpoint, you're negotiating like as you think about working with your lawyer, you're negotiating and um, the acquisition of the business. You're negotiating a credit facility because most of these deals are leveraged, um, and then you're negotiating the equity investment from your investors. So those are all um, obviously important to uh, um, you know to to think about. Um, Legal diligence, good question. Um, what, are, what should we be looking for? And then how much does it cost? We're gonna talk about that in a little bit. Um, why does an LLC set up, sit above the acquired company? The investors buy the, yes, the investors buy the interest in the LLC above the acquired company. So you have an extra um, layer of sort of separation between the investors and the company itself. Um, most of the time, um, and then do people use blocker entities between the, um, search fund LLC and the OPCO. And, and so the answer to that is they can and they do sometimes when it's appropriate. Um, so we typically set it up this way. So I'm going to kind of answer both of those questions. And I'm going to um, move the diligence one to a little bit later in the talk, if that's okay with everybody. And I think I may have just missed one more in the chat here. Um, 1202 impact carry on economics. Yep. Okay. So let's, um, let's just deal with all three of those uh, right now on the prior, maybe on the prior slide. Um, yeah. So Okay, the the you can put a hold co in um, above or below this entity. You can this acquired company could be a, an a C corp. If the acquired company is a C corp, um, then you can talk about getting 1202, and and it, it is possible that you can get 1202 treatment. Um, I think in the search fund world, I still have not seen. Um, acquiring C corps and seeking 1202 treatment, or acquiring businesses and then putting in them into C corp solution and then seeking 1202 treatment. Um, I have not seen that as becoming common practice um, yet. We've certainly talked about it on every deal, and we we have the accountants and, and sort of the searchers model out whether that makes 
more sense um, to get the benefit. And 1202 is a um, it's a tax code reference, and it allows um, the, the benefit of shielding certain capital gains on certain transactions. And again, probably more detailed than than we need to be on this call. But um, we certainly talk about it, and we certainly discuss it. But it doesn't. Um, it, it is not where we typically end up here. Um, and so, and it, it does impact, and this is again, more detailed than I think we're, but feel free to reach out separately if you want to talk. There, it, it could in theory impact your carry and how that works because of tax distributions um, within a more classic kind of pass-through structure. So there is potentially some additional benefit if you use this 1202 structure. But again, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to avoid kind of going down that road because I think we're going to, we're going to get off track a little bit, but it certainly can be done. Um, and then the hold co, you could put in a hold co for um, banking purposes. You may need a hold co in there because your um, lender is going to require a pledge and you don't want all the investors have to sign a pledge, um, which is a very standard. But again, the search fund can sign the pledge typically, but you may want an inter intermediate hold co in there. Um, and, and, you know, people, you, you don't typically need the blocker corp um, like we think about in the more classic private equity sense because these investors typically don't need a blocker in there. Um, the investors, again, classic search fund investors are all very, very used to investing in pass-throughs. So we don't end up typically needing to, to stick a blocker in there for, um, for, for, for to, to protect that investor. Again, very different than, than private equity in that sense, but, but it certainly comes up and, and you know, we could talk about it if it was appropriate and if it needed to be done. Um, so I think, I'm a, I think I've covered those. I'm gonna just make sure before we move, um, on here um yes yeah, good question so so at the time that uh um the and i don't mean if i read if i read somebody's question i don't say it's a good question it doesn't mean that i don't think it's a good question i just um i don't i don't think i've done that yet but, but please don't take it personally so i i just um that if at the time you do an acquisition there are still funds in your search fund um, they still get stepped up. So you're not, again, you know, 10 years ago. And I think if you look at the Stanford um, primer PPM, it still has that language that you could give money back to the investors. So just, you know, if you're using that as your template, just be a little careful with that because investors will get annoyed if that um, is in there because it's not really market right now. Um, again, as with everything, if you make it market, the searchers make it market, go for it. Um, you know, but I don't think the investors are too excited about that. So if there's money in your search at the end, you just put it toward the acquisition so you can raise a little bit less capital. Um, that's again the very sort of standard way to deal with it. I've had searchers say, "Oh, I should get that as a bonus. I found my deal too fast, or you know, and and everything." And I, I would I would submit to you that I represent the fund, and if your investors say that's a great idea, I will be happy to write a piece of paper that says that you can have all that money. And if the investors approve of it, then do whatever you want. I just that's not um, market though. So it would be a very atypical to take that as a bonus um, in a traditional search fund. And when I say very atypical. Um, I would say that I, I've never done it. I've never seen it. And I think investors have um, heard about it and tell me to um, that, that they would never agree to it. So, you know, I may as well have a conversation with searchers that it, they're not going to agree to it. And then the searcher, though, can still go and have that conversation because they should. I mean, again, we represent the company. We don't represent you personally. Um, so that uh, that being said, I think we're kind of through this um, this set of uh, of sort of um, of the, the talk. And, and I want to move in to the next set, which is timing. And this is kind of a legal perspective on timing, but I'm going to go through this a little bit, um, a little bit more quickly, just so we understand what we're talking about in the last section, which is the diligence section. And I think that the, the diligence section is, it, it sounds like there's a little bit of interest in, in talking about that. So we'll, we'll talk about that when we get there. Um, so if you think about timing for a transaction, you got pre LOI, that's kind of searching. Then you've got the LOI, then you've got, okay, what do I do now? I have a signed LOI. Does that mean I start drafting a purchase agreement? You know, no. Um, and then you've got the definitive agreements, which are sort of post LOI. Um, so pre-letter of intent, some people work in an auction context. You know, that's one way to think about it. Another is proprietary. Um, in an auction, somebody else is running the timeline. In proprietary, you're running the timeline. Um, you got to determine the purchase price. This is kind of the key thing. And then also how much cash is coming off the table to the seller. So those are the things that like, it's not even, you don't even really get to an LOI if you haven't figured out the value of the business. There's not much point in signing an LOI where you don't have at least a, a, a framework. I mean, I prefer a, a pure kind of like a number here or, or something, but you at least need a framework. Um, and then your kind of pre-LOI, does this company make sense? Is there too much customer concentration? Never, investors are never going to like this. 
um, is there pricing power here? Is there some supplier that kind of controls the business? Investors aren't going to like that. Um, are there synergies? Are there redundancies? Is there some reason why, you know, this business is going to be great? Or, you know, is this already kind of capped out and sort of at the end of its growth stage? Maybe we don't want to do this. Um, what's the founder going to do following the closing? You know, is this is this something that we should be concerned about? Is it a 40-year-old founder you're buying the business from? Would you be really concerned about a non-compete? Or is it a 65-year-old founder that we're buying the business from? And we want to make sure that that, you know, that that person stays around, helps with sort of transitioning relationships, et cetera. Maybe you want to sit on the board. Maybe you want to give the person rollover equity. There, there's a, a bunch of different things kind of pre-LOI that you at least want a, an idea of um, before you you take the next step. And then letter of intent, again, I can do a whole presentation on letters of intent. So I'm going to kind of, I mean, hopefully, you know, a letter of intent is this is when you really have started to decide I'm going to start spending my time um, and my effort, you know, potentially my resources funds um, on legal diligence, meaning you don't really do a ton. You don't really want to be spending a ton on third party fees or your own time, which is very valuable um, pre LOI. But you have to do some of that work, like I said, but otherwise you kind of get to this letter, letter of intent. And letter of intent is basically now we have an agreement on price. You want to get exclusivity um, and a basic agreement on price, at least at least a framework, but probably some agreement on price um, or, or valuation, you know, depending on how you think about it. And then you want to get exclusivity as a buyer. Very important because, again, in the search fund, you got a clock and it's ticking. You don't want to be going down the road. Again, in an auction, it's going to be a little bit different. I think search funders in auctions are not a great, you know, you know, not not a great chance of winning. I think it's it's a, those are a challenge. Um, you know, not that it never happens, it could. Um, so you want to get ex exclusivity. That means that when the LOI is signed, that seller is only negotiating with you for some period of time. Again, and I, I think 60 is fairly normal. I think 30 is too short for a buyer. There's no way you're going to get a deal done. I think it's good to ask for 90 um, and then you should have some sort of, a, you know, an evergreen period on it where you can, you know, it can automatically extend if you kind of get to the end of that. So um, you, you as a buyer here, and again, search fund world, this is very different. And I, and I give a different talk when I'm speaking to private equity or to sellers, you know, but you as a buyer in an ETA transaction, you want to get to exclusivity for sure. But if you don't have an agreement on price, if you're walking in thinking that what we're going to do is well, we're going to sign this thing and then we're going to kind of pull the wool over their eyes by, you know, by, by doing something in the working capital adjustment because you came out of this private equity world and this is the, the this is what we used to do at my private equity shop. It's fine. You, you, you can do that. And nothing, you're, you're, you can take that approach. In the search fund world, it backfires, I think, more often than it succeeds because the sellers have in their mind, I'm going to take this amount of cash off the table. That's what they're thinking. So you need to like sort of think, put your seller hat on and the seller, like oh, if, if they just walk away, they just walk away. It's a, it's a non-binding letter of intent. They can walk away. So you don't want to be too aggressive, I think, on transactions like this. And the numbers, again, are just much smaller than in some more kind of classic private equity settings. So um, then then post LOI, again, we, we can spend tons, tons and tons of time on letter of intent, but just call me separately and let's have a conversation if we want to spend time. I don't want to spend a ton of time from the, the chat um, on letters of intent. Um, business diligence, this is kind of post LOI diligence. So, so this is where I want to, like you and I should work together. I don't want you, I don't want to start incurring legal fees until you are, are really kind of through and comfortable with these other sets of diligence. So your own your own diligence, business diligence, what you're doing, you know, reviewing customers and making sure that relationships are good, et cetera. Um, tax and accounting, sort of financial diligence, um, quality of earnings. So a lot of times the same service provider will do that. You want somebody to do that for you. You want a third party to do that. Um, IT diligence is something that that people need on certain deals. You you know you may need like some like a real true kind of uh, somebody that can that, that can assess software. You may need that on your deal. Um, benefits and insurance diligence. That that to me is more like private equity. I'm not sure that everybody not not every search fund kind of hires a third party to do that. I mean, then legal diligence and, and legal diligence is, is where we focus um, our time. But I want you to have all those other things done first because I don't want to start incurring legal fees. Um, until we're so we have more certainty to to getting a deal done. Um, so then you know let's talk about legal diligence highlights. These are similar for every um, transaction, any type of M&A transaction. These are these are like private equity or ETA or you know and, and kind of anywhere within the ETA spectrum. These are are kind of items that matter for every um, for every acquisition transaction and, and legal diligence. Um, 
it can, I, I don't, I don't really price it. There was somebody, you know, asked a question about what does legal diligence cost and like, what are we, what should we focus on and that sort of thing. I'm going to go through sort of things that we should focus on. Um, I don't price out legal diligence separate from uh, an M&A transaction. It's just part and parcel of what we have to do. So we're doing diligence, you know, as we're, as we're drafting documents, as we're kind of reviewing disclosure schedules, as we're reviewing materials that get provided, um, as, as the bank asks questions, as your investors ask questions. I mean, there's no like, there's no real true um, beginning or end to legal diligence. I mean, it starts the day you call me and say, hey, I want to talk about an LOI. You know, I'll say something like, hey, who owns the business? And you'll say, oh, I'm not sure. I, I'm talking to the CEO and I sort of assume that the CEO owns the business, but you know, we should probably confirm that before we sign an LOI with somebody who doesn't have the authority to sell the business. Um, so that, that, you know, that can be a piece of legal diligence. Um, but, but that, so, so like, to me, it's, it's sort of not, I don't think about it in terms of, Hey, diligence is going to cost this and then drafting and negotiating documents is going to cost this and then closing is going to cost this. And I can, you know, again, if you want to have a specific call with me about a specific deal, we could talk about what's that going to cost, but on a self-funded, you know, million dollar, um, enterprise value transaction, um, it's, it's going to be a larger percentage, but a smaller dollar amount. Um, and then on a bigger deal, it's going to be a, you know, a larger dollar amount, but a smaller percentage of the, of the fee, probably because we're going to have more um, negotiating, we're going to have more drafting, there's going to be more stuff to do. Um, so there's different ways to kind of think about, um, to think about that, but our ov overall um, fees will be, um, will be higher on larger deals and our overall fees will be lower on smaller deals. But the proportion within that, the proportion that we spend on diligence um, varies depending on, on this is some, some searchers want to do a lot of diligence themselves. They say, I don't want you to look at the customer agreements. I'm just going to look at that myself, but that's fine. Or they'll say, I want you to look at, um, the, just the change of control or anti-assignment provisions in the contracts. We will look at everything else. Um, and so that's the, that's kind of the, um, the, the, the way that I think about those fees and diligence fees and then legal fees overall. And, and there's a question in the chat, do you typically defer fees? Um, we do, we, we typically defer fees for, um, for search fund transactions. Again, similar for private equity. Um, if, if you're in the middle of running a, a transaction, we just expect to get paid when the transaction closes. Um, you know, if, if there are busted deals and, and there's, you know, we've run up a, a bunch of legal fees, if it's a, a you know, a, a thousand bucks or a few thousand bucks or whatever, we you know, and you pay it or you don't pay it, I'm not sure that people get too worked up about it. But if you have, you know, a big uh, deal fee and it's a busted deal, then, then we should certainly talk about that. But otherwise, you know, we just expect that, that you're going to pay us when a transaction closes. So, so that's uh, hopefully that answers the, the, the question about deferring fees. Um, so legal diligence highlights. Um, you know, what is, what, what is diligence? Uh, we kind of talked about that. What's covered by financial diligence, what's covered by legal, and then what's covered by other serv service providers. Um, you know, it, it's, it's sort of um, to some degree self-explanatory, you know, financial diligence, the, they'll look at the, the tax, they'll look at their, they'll look at your the, the business's financial statements, and then they'll do the quality of earnings and make sure that those numbers um, the EBITDA that you're pricing your deal based on is actually what the EBITDA of the business is going forward when you've gotten rid of some of the noise within the, you know, you know within the sort of um, financial statements. So again, when you, these search fund deals, very, very rarely do you have an audit. Um, you're lucky if you have compiled um, accounting financial statements. A lot of times it's just a QuickBooks um, and, and they send you the QuickBooks or they give you access to the QuickBooks. I mean, it's, it's, it's you know, it's interesting, you know, the way that you get financial information. So it's important that you, um, personally understand the financials, but did you also have a, a third party um, service provider look at those financials? And, and in a self-funded deal, do you do a full quality of earnings? Um, no, sometimes you do something, you know, called a proof of cash, but I, I still think it makes sense to have a third party um, look at the financials because I think um, searchers have a tendency to, um, you know, they, they, they find a deal they like and, oh, that I can just see myself running this company and you sort of, you know, it's like, oh, and then, then you then you have a little bit less of an objective eye on looking at these financials. I think it's important to get a third party to look at that. Um, dil legal diligence, is, we'll talk about what we cover in legal diligence. And then other service providers would be like we talked about mood software or something like that. Um, so, and Paul, I think we're we're going. I'm gonna I'm gonna finish in you know in a, in a couple minutes here, but but hopefully that kind of answers the the basics um, of 
diligence, cost, how we sort of think about it. Um, and anybody, you know, I, I think anybody, obviously, I think I put my contact information up at the front. I'm happy to be contacted um, by anybody at any time for, you know, talk further about any of these things. So and, and Rob, on that, on that topic, and we do have a few more minutes, uh, of course, we just finish up, but, but when people contact you, is there anything you like for them to have prepared ahead of time or, or just kind of reach out to you at any stage in the, uh, in the process? No, yeah, no, I'm, I'm a resource um, for people. So, I mean, I, I, people can call me and say, what kind of search fund should I do? Um, or what kind of ETA should I do? Or they can call me and say, I've got a signed LOI, you know, what would it look like to work together? And, and I, I've, I've talked to people all over the, you know, at any, you know, again, all over the sort of the, the spectrum there of, of like where they are in the process. So legal diligence, who owns the target? Um, it's important, um, you know, can drive structure to some degree. If you've got a bunch of owners, there's different ways we would do the deal than if there's one. Um, who does the target own? Uh, you know, are there subsidiaries? Um, you know, uh, and, and also, um, do they do they have title to the assets that they own? Are there a bunch of trucks and, you know, you thought you owned the truck, you thought they owned the, all these trucks that have the name painted on the side, but they're actually leased. Oh, I didn't, I didn't realize that, you know, and then when you look at the financials and you dig a little bit deeper, um, they're, they're leased or they're, you know, they're, they're bought, but there's a, a lien on them for a, you know, $2 million debt and all that. And that didn't show up on the balance sheet. Well, why not? It, well, because the balance sheet's not audited. And so an accountant would have put it in a different spot. So, you know, you want to make sure that you're, that the company owns its assets. And obviously a new lender coming in is going to want them to be free and clear. So we want to figure that out. Um, obviously IP is another critical one. Um, if, if some, you know, person, Develop the software, and it wasn't as an, in an employment relationship. Is it clear that the company owns the software? Um, you know, we we need to figure that out. So, so those are kind of you know things that we would figure out in diligence. Are there hidden obligations? Is there a pension plan? Um, you know, that that can be something that that you know companies are like I mean, very very rare now, and especially rare in like recently formed companies or businesses. You know, formed more recently that it's very rare to have a pension plan, but it could exist. Um, like I said, the leases could be kind of a hidden obligation. I didn't realize that. I saw the trucks with the name painted. I just assumed that you owned them. Well, well, you know, you didn't. You found that out in diligence. Um, so, you know, th there can also be contracts that have, you know, requirements in there. You have to give this person, um, you know, a million dollars of business per year. Um, and we didn't see that because we didn't look at the contract. So there's various things like that that you want to find in, in diligence that, are, that can be hidden obligations. Um, another key thing that we see in deals these days is, is employees versus contractors that, that companies are, the government is much more um, in tune with this issue, especially in small businesses. Um, people want to have, you know, quote employees, but they want to treat them as contractors. And if you, if it, you know, walks like a duck and quacks like a duck, it's a duck. And, and so, you know, even if you put contractor at the top of the contract, if that person is working for you 40 hours a week, has a non-compete obligation, has to wear a, you know, a hat that says booth on it, that you may be a booth employee, right? Even if it says contractor. So we need to diligence that issue. You need to understand that because the way that you as a business and the way that it's going to kind of hit your EBITDA, um, if you have an employee versus if you have an independent contractor is going to be critical as, as you're kind of going through and, and thinking about your deal. So, so that's very much a, um, a, a key diligence matter. And then um, just general legal compliance. For these types of businesses, ETA types of businesses, legal compliance is, is almost always inadequate. So I asked the question, is, is the legal compliance adequate? And the answer is no. Um, I just don't know why it's not yet because we haven't done the diligence, but almost certainly there are going to be things that, that are not, um, that are just not done appropriately because of, of the type of business. And the again, it's been kind of been run as a mom and pop shop, didn't have professional money, didn't we didn't really care about those things well all of that's going to change when you close your deal and you bring in professional money so um that's 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 it so those are the the kind of key diligence topics hopefully this covered the the items that we wanted to cover and got the items from the chat um and you know again i think we're right at the end of our time but but happy to kind of um you know happy to, to connect with anybody and um, separately and and uh <clears throat> thanks. I appreciate everybody's attendance and and uh, and and participation today.